Hello, everyone. Um, welcome, and thank you for attending today's IBM Middleware User Community webcast. My name is Kelsey Tipsherini, and I'll be hosting today's webcast. Our topic for today is creating agile organizations. Also, lines are currently in listen-only mode. There will be a question and answer session towards the end of the presentation. However, you may ask a question at any time during the presentation using the questions window located in the control panel. Also, look for a forum link in your chat box, and feel free to continue any discussions after the webcast in the forum. Tomorrow, we will have the recording uh, and slides of today's presentation available on the IBM Middleware User Community website for you to access. You'll receive a follow-up email with the link to the archives. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We have joining us Anthony Crane, um, Agile Transformation with Blue Agility. Thank you, Anthony, for joining us today. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, let's get started. It looks like we have um, about 45 minutes, and then uh, the last 15 can be for additional questions, but I definitely encourage anybody who has questions to ask them as we go, as opposed to waiting until the end. I think that's more fun. Um, okay, so this session is Creating Agile Organizations, um, and uh, I delivered it at IBM Interconnect for 2017, and I was invited to do it as a webcast as well, so that was really exciting. Uh, so I hope you guys find it valuable. My name is Anthony Crane. Um, I've got 20-some uh, years of IT experience. I think it's actually higher than that now. Um, and uh, it says here I'm passionate about metrics. I really am. Uh, love talking about metrics. I think that they can be very helpful. Um, I specialize in agile portfolio management, so helping organizations figure out um, how to determine the ROI of things like going agile and also how to manage um, staffing of, of initiatives um, and, uh, and then understanding how to adjust your spend based on performance across your projects in your IT. Um, and then uh, for pretty much my whole career, I've been helping organizations do transformational initiatives. Uh, so that pretty much sums me up. And uh, I guess there's a fun fact down here that I want to be a Food Network star. I apply every year. And uh, so far, I have not gotten that call back. But uh, I'll keep applying. OK, so uh, this here is our agenda for today. Um, one is I'm going to give you some definitions, uh, it's including what are SLPs. You've probably heard of SLAs. This is kind of similar. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about skill growth gamification. Uh, some people have heard of gamification now, more and more people. There, it's, uh, there's tons of books on it and everything, but we'll talk a little bit about how, what gamification is and how we use it um, for our transformations. Uh, and then, um, based on that gamification, you learn that one of the things that we do is we like to clearly define the skills that we want people or organizations to learn. For transformation of an organization, there are a total of 12 transformation badges that a, that your transformation team, if you form one, could earn. And so we'll get into those 12 badges. And then finally, um, I compiled a list of things that I like to use during transformation that I feel help um, move transformations forward. So that's pretty much our agenda, some definitions, skill growth, uh, the badges, and that's the meat of it is those badges. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with the same. So uh, if that sounds good to you, then you're on the right call. And if it doesn't, then um, if you drop off, I won't. you won't hurt my feelings. OK. Um, so moving on from here, so far no questions. Uh, and I definitely encourage those. Um, so first thing is I want to define something for you. It's called an SLP, or service level pattern. It's not a real phrase. I made it up. Maybe someone else has also. But uh, as far as I know, I made this term up. Uh, I made it up because I've heard the word service level agreement a lot, which is a commitment to do something in a certain way or within a certain time frame or both. Um, so in this case, I, I noticed that um, there's a lot of patterns in how things unfold. For example, one of my favorite questions to ask uh, if I'm interviewing someone who wants to do transformation, I ask them about how long would it take to take a team from uh, I've never done agile to self-sufficient where they can be, um, they no longer need you know, coaching or guidance. Um, so that's a pattern, right? How long does it take to do something like that? So what I've learned is the more of these SLPs I start to look for, um, the more I'm able to plan and predict. Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to do is shield teams from having to do estimation um, about money and, and time and all that. So instead, I just want to know the SLP. Look, it doesn't, it, I'm not asking the team to commit to a time frame. I just want to know what their time frames have been historically, and then I can use that for my planning at the portfolio level. So an SLP is all about looking for patterns and then using them for planning without forcing people to commit to those patterns. We just simply look at the patterns and use them for smart planning. Um, so it's not a commitment. It's a pattern based on actuals. 
Uh, it can be used for planning, but it's still not a commitment. It's stated as a range in probability. So, for example, um, if someone asked me how long would it take me to get a team to self-sufficient and agile, I might say seven to ten weeks, 80% of the time. Um, and then I also could have factors for why it's below seven or above ten. Um, so, you know, in this case, this team was geographically distributed. Um, and uh, or there was not one person co-located and so that's why it took you know 15 weeks instead of 10 or whatever but by having the factors you can even use those as well in the estimation game so that's what an SLP is looks like there's no questions on SLP okay let's move on uh, now over here um, because I've been focused on this SLP thing um, I look at the there's four levels of coaching that I like to do and, and again when I'm when I'm transforming an organization or, or, or finding others to help me do transformations, um, there are four different roles that I see people coming into. How to coach a team, how to coach a program, how to coach a portfolio, and then how to create an agile organization. Um, so this session today is the one in orange, how to create an agile organization. So the reason I'm showing you this is, is in order for your companies to create an agile organization, they will have to figure out how to coach their teams, coach their programs, coach their portfolio teams, and to create their own agile organization. Um, but what I like here is that I put down some SLPs for you. A team is seven to 10 weeks. Uh, to coach a program typically takes about 12 weeks, 80% of the time. There's no range on this one. It just typically takes 12. It can be more or less. The portfolio team can be two to 18 weeks. Um, before they are completely self-sufficient, but that's 90% of the time. So it's a wider range, but it's, uh, it's a tighter percentage that that happens. But here's the fun part. To create an agile organization, people ask me this all the time. Um, and uh, it, again, this is just based on my experience um, and on what I've heard from my peers, um, it, which uh, I guess some of them are on my call today, because I think I saw some names on the list I recognize. Um, so uh, to create an agile organization, typically it takes us six to 24 months. Um, now, what, another interesting thing is some transformations never end. They are they're forever improving, continuous improving, and having a team that leads that kind of improvement. And as long as they can demonstrate that they're making the organization better, they're con they continue to operate. But uh, the 6 24 month range is typically how long I've spent with a client before I roll off and go on to another client. So, um, and, and that's, again, to get them to that, that place where they feel like they've become an agile organization. Any surprises here? Okay. All right, so back to the agenda then. That's really the one definition I want to share with you guys is what's an SLP. Um, so hopefully you guys can use that idea in your own work. Uh, in the meantime, let's move into skill growth gamification. So um, with gamification, basically, for those who are not familiar with that term, it just means that we take behaviors that are important to a business uh, and make them somehow important to either customers or employees by turning those behaviors into games. So if you want someone to write more blogs on your website, you give them points for writing blogs or you give them a medal for writing blogs. Um, right now I, I do a lot of reviews for Yelp and, uh, and for um, TripAdvisor. And TripAdvisor, they send me updates every few months to tell me how many points I've earned and how many people have read my reviews, uh, how many comments I've gotten on them, how many likes I've gotten, all in a little summary. Total gamification, giving me, you know, it's like, oh, if you post three more reviews, you'll get to level three as, a, as, a, as an author. And I'm like, ooh, a level three sounds kind of good. Um, so that's gamification. It's taking behaviors that are valuable to the business and making them valuable to me, purely through game mechanics. So um, we can also use it internally, and that's one of my favorite ways to change culture. So one of the hardest things about going agile is that you have to change culture. And one fun way to do that is to create that list of the behaviors or the skills that you wish your new cult, your organizational culture had. And then you, you recognize it when people embrace and exhibit those, those behaviors or those skills. So for us, what we've done is we've created skill badges for all four coaching levels, coach a team, coach a program, coach a portfolio, and then for this session, coach an agile transformation team. And you can see uh, for a team, there's as many as 54 or more badges. An example might be agile estimation. So when you learn how to do agile estimation, you get a very low level badge, a learning badge, if you will. But every time you go and estimate something, your badge grows up until a maximum of level five for our teams. So um, there's an incentive then to grow your your skill and and to be recognized for it in the game. So there's 54 badges for teams. For programs, there's only 15 badges. Um, the 54 for teams still apply. 
because a program team is still a team. Um, so if you think about it, then there's 15 additional badges that a program team might earn that a, that a normal team would not. An example here might be Scrum Scrum. So if when you master doing Scrum Scrums, you get a badge for that and you can grow it. A portfolio team has 10 additional badges. So again, they're a team. So they would still be subject to the 54 badges from the first level. But they have, in addition, 10 different badges that they might look at. One example would be intake management. So how do we manage intake of new work? Um, that's a skill that our portfolio team can learn. And finally, the transformation team. So um, for, for most of my clients, they only have this once. So it's not repeatable. But for me, doing it for a living, I've, I've discovered lots and lots of patterns. Uh, and my peers have discovered lots and lots of patterns. And they've helped me to create these, um, these badges. So there's uh, 12 of them. And those are the badges that we're going to cover in today's session. Any questions on gamification or these four levels or the way that we're using badges to help people learn? Um, I have clients, uh, multiple clients, who have claimed that they believe the reason their culture shifted so quickly was this gamification. People got so excited about playing a game that they started trying and experimenting more than they ever had before. And agile teams should be experimental, right? So this kind of embraced that and helped them to, to move their culture along. So I encourage you to try it to change your own. OK, so that's it for the gamification part. Like I said uh, earlier, the real meat of this session is going to be in the transformation badges. So let's get into that now. There's 12 of them. Uh, let's see what they have to offer. OK, so um, we have uh, 12 transformation team badges. Um, and uh, the idea is that if we actually counted how often the transformation team um, earn the badge, we could then estimate the entire roll-off. For example, if there's 12 badges and our transformation team earns two badges after one month, we could assume that they're going to keep that pace up and that they might be done in six months. That's the low end, if you remember, of that SLP we saw before, six to 24 months. On the other hand, if it takes a transformation team um, two months just to earn one badge, well, then there's 12 badges times two months. That would be about 24 months. So by having these badges, these learning badges, we're sharpening how people think, we're sharpening what people learn, but we're also being able to estimate then roll off of, a, of, a, of an opportunity. So that's kind of fun. Um, so down below are the 12 badges that a transformation team might earn. So it's probably important at this point to say badge number one is transformation team formation. So what does this mean? It means that if you want your organization to go agile or to transform, uh, you need a team, an actual team that's full-time dedicated to this initiative. And this is something that a lot of my clients have trouble getting their minds around. Um, what, is that, what is that team going to do? How long will they be together? You know, wh who, who should those people be? Um, the first thing is acknowledging it's actually a very powerful technique. If you don't do this, your transformation will probably not happen. If it does happen, it'll take years and years. Um, but with, with a transformation team, that's when you can get to that six to 24-month range. So badge number one is simply forming that team. If you form that team, um, according to some best practices that we help uh, you figure out, or you know, just guess if you want to, um, you can earn the badge for that. And now you have a team that can earn the rest of these badges. So it's kind of a, a funny thing. You have to form the team in order for someone to be there to earn these badges. And yet here I am showing the badges to people already. In addition to transformation team formation, we have sustainable coaching model. Um, where we want to create a way to make sure that teams that are new have the help they need. Uh, pilot teams management, that is, um, well, you're going to have more demand than you have capacity for coaching once you start getting some momentum. And so how do you manage that? Culture change acceleration. I already hinted that one way to accelerate culture change is to do a gamification, but there are other things we can do. Transformation metrics. So you need to measure whether or not your transformation is successful. Um, and so we can, this, this badge is all about learning how to do that. Skill growth management is all about taking people and growing their skill. So again, the gamification we talked about directly ties to number six. But there are other things as well, such as training, that you might need to look at for skill growth management. Um, number seven is continuous improvement. So as you roll out a new organization, that organization is going to have flaws. And that methodology is going to have flaws. Uh, we need a way to roll out our solution immediately, and then improve it from that baseline. Right? And so continuous improvement would be that, that uh, badge you could earn for that. Communities of practice, or COPS, COP, you'll see that a lot. 
Um, I think most people have probably heard of these by now, but uh, it's a way to help people who are not on the same team, people who are not in the same part of the organization, to collaborate on something they're passionate about to advance the state of the union for the entire company. So how do we make this better for ourselves? Um, they're completely self-organizing. Um, but you can earn badges for getting those up and running. Then the next three or four are kind of interesting, nine through 12. Um, number nine is high-performing teams. This badge is all about creating teams that are not just self-sufficient but high-performing but high also. And, uh, and what we do on our teams is we actually create features to drive our work, and we create a new feature for every team we're going to coach, and we actually move that feature through some states until it gets to closed. When that feature is closed, that team is exhibiting high-performance um, minimum standards, if you will. So each time we do a high-performing team, we kind of instantiate this badge. Same thing with high-performing programs. This is a program, a team of teams, instead of a single team. And the same thing with adult portfolio management. However, usually we only have to do that one one time. I do have clients, however, that have multiple portfolio teams, and each one wants to be helped, and so we actually help multiple times. And so in that case, there would be multiple instances of this badge. But, um, uh, but most time, it's just one. Um, and then uh, finally, the last one is the strangest one at all, number 12. It's high-performing transformation team. The only way you can earn this 12th badge is if you help another transformation team launch. So for me, this is my number one badge, right? I keep helping teams launch, and that's why I, I have a level five transformation team, high-performing transformation team badge myself. But at my current client, uh, we took the ball very far already, and then my um, the leader of my team, he got promoted. And now they want him to do the same thing across a much larger organization, in fact, unifying multiple organizations that all have done Agile in some way or shape or form into one bigger, better way. And so we are redoing all these badges a second time with a whole new team. Um, and so in this case, he's actually earning badge 12 because he's helping another transformation get launched. Okay, so um, those are the 12 badges. And the idea is for the rest of the deck, I have a slide or two or three about each one of these areas so that we can dig a little bit deeper and get you guys a head start on how to actually do these 12 ideas. Um, so are there any questions on the overview? Any questions on how we're using the badges, why we split it up this way, why we call them badges, all that kind of stuff. Again, I don't see much questions yet in the in the chat room, but uh, if you have them, go for it. Meanwhile, I will just continue going forward. Okay, so um, I can't obviously go into great detail on each of the 12 badges. There's not enough time um, in 45 minutes. Uh, but uh, what I can do is, in my opinion, each of these 12 badges has some what I call secret sauce. Uh, I, I, I'm, it's a term my company uses a lot, blue agility. Um, but uh, uh, it's not one I, I was familiar with, but I get the idea. It's what makes it unique and special, so I've adopted it into my vocabulary now. So the secret sauce ideas for the 12 badges. Um, so first off, each of these workshops, each of these badges has a corresponding workshop. So that means I have 12 workshops for the transformation team. Um, and in a workshop, you basically are given a kit of reusable assets, and we re reuse those assets plus our own smarts to achieve whatever that badge is all about. So the, so the workshop helps us to move the ball faster. Um, so I'll show you the secret sauce of those 12 workshops then. Um, the stuff that I think is less obvious. Um, I didn't want to, there's some things that are so obvious about this, I'm like, I don't need to waste our precious time, precious time on those obvious things. Um, or the stuff that I find surprises people. They're like, oh wow, I didn't think that that would be the way. So I also wanted to include that. Uh, and then for the more typical stuff, I figure you can figure that out on your own through trial and error, okay? So hopefully you do agree that the pieces I show today will be the secret sauce level components of making an organization become more agile. Okay, so practice number one, or workshop number one, or badge number one, however you want to call it, um, is forming your team. So a huge best practice in any transformation, and I did this before I was agile. I did it when I did iterative. I did it when I did rough, rational unified process. I did it when I did the spiral model. Um, when you want to transform an organization to a new methodology, you need to form a team that's going to lead that, and that team should use the same methodology that they're asking everyone else 
to follow. Okay, the reason we do that is so that we get credibility and we have empathy and we have experience and we become coaches to all those people because we've done it too. So who should be on this team? Uh, well, first you have to get an executive sponsor who's willing to fund the team, and so that's the biggest challenge is getting the funding. But once funded. You want people with a passion for Agile or for whatever it is you're transforming to, in our case, Agile. Um, but you also need people with authority to change. So these are the people who don't take no for an answer and either can themselves eliminate and set policy or who know and have relationships with the people who know and set policy. Because we're going to have to change something. So they have to have the authority to make that happen. These people will earn the 12 badges that we saw above. So that's what they should be excited about, the things that we listed. Um, but they also are going to earn badges at the team, program, and portfolio level because these transformational people, they're going to help teams. They're going to help programs. They're going to help portfolios. So they're not, they're not just going to earn the 12 badges you saw. They're going to earn all the ones that you didn't see today. Um, now, if when you start, people sometimes are paralyzed. I don't know. You know, We don't have the team yet. We can't start. What I've learned is start anyway. Right, uh, fail fast according to the agile principles. Right, get things going. So it's okay if you have the wrong people to begin with. Um, the minute that you start hitting impediments to your transformation, that are really kind of dumb. Like everyone on the team agrees, this is a really dumb impediment, and yet we can't get it removed. When that happens, um, and you cannot remove what is obviously not a smart smart impediment like this then you're definitely missing people. Right? And that, at that point, you're like, well, what kind of people do we need to get rid of stupid impediments like this one? Um, so um, you will adjust your team based on, on impediments. But also, we've learned, we've, we sometimes start with a big team of 12 people. And after like two sprints, we notice only four or five are actually doing anything. They're really the core team. And then another sprint later, one of those two or two of those two, uh, two of those five people, they get busy on their real life and they, they abandoned us for a while. And then, but meanwhile, at the same time, two of the other people who were quieter earlier suddenly found something to be passionate about. So we've also discovered that there's some fluidity on who is our members. Now, if you have a funded project with people full-time dedicated, you won't see that kind of behavior. People will actually be dedicated and get the stuff done. Um, but when you have a lot of bunch of people who are part-time, then you're going to see you know, that membership shifting. Um, so there you go. Any questions on how to form an Agile transformation team? OK. Um, the next thing you have to do is create a sustainable coaching model. Um, so in this case, every team that launches using your new methodology, in this case Agile, they're probably going to need some help, right? especially if this stuff is complicated as Agile is. Um, so one thing, that's where I make my living, right? Clearly, people hire me to come in and, and do this sort of work in my, my company um, as well. We, you know, this is, this is our bread and butter. But the idea is to get rid of us as fast as possible, right? And it, maybe it's not smart business-wise to say so, but it's the truth. So if you have internal experienced people that you can afford to turn into coaches, that's what you do. If not, you, you get some outsiders. But if you get outsiders, you need to also nominate junior coaches who will replace those outsiders. Um, and so that way, that's your fastest path to getting rid of us. If you do not nominate junior coaches, then you're going to be dependent on us for a lot longer. So the goal, the goal is to, as soon as possible, nominate them. Um, and, uh, uh, and then you'll either replace us, or it might be that you keep us because we, you have you know, hundreds of teams, and, and uh, you like the extra uh, bandwidth you get by having some externals. Um, also, you're going to want to form a community of practice around the coaches. In fact, if you don't have communities of practice today, typically in the organizations I work with, the coaching um, community of practice is the first one that forms. And scrum masters are usually welcome to attend that one as well because scrum masters and coaches have a very similar role. Um, the other thing that we can do is uh, if you don't want to nominate coaches, so some companies have a problem with that, um, we can go back to the gamification system. So I mentioned before that we measure people's skill and it goes anywhere from level zero to level five, uh, level five being top. Well, what we do is if you want to get to level four or level five in any skill, agile estimation, retrospectives, demos, if you want to get to level four or level five in those skills, the only way to get there is to help other people grow their badges. So it's a pyramid scheme. 
It's a big pyramid scheme of learning. We have the top level people trying to find lower level people to teach, and we have lower level people who can't earn their badges unless they have someone who knows how to do it teaching them. If you do this, then you're, then your dependency on external coaches and even junior coaches is reduced um, because now anybody can help anybody as long as they have a level four, level five badge. Okay. Any questions on sustainable coaching model? This is what we've done to help make coaching possible within large organizations. All right, next one is pilot team management. So with pilot teams management, um, we have uh, we have eventually you're going to get more people knocking on the door saying we want to do what everyone else seems to be doing and loving and doing so well at. Right, you're going to start getting more requests for coaching than your sustainable coaching model can and endure. So what do we do when we have too many teams coming to us? What I've seen many companies do is they just say yes to everyone. Now, the problem with just saying yes to everyone is that your coaching ratio gets completely thrown away. Why is it important? If I'm a coach on just three teams by myself, it is almost guaranteed that those three teams will schedule some of their most important ceremonies that I need to be there for at the same time. Team one is doing their retrospective at the same time as team two is doing their plan. Team three and team two both have their stand-up meetings at the same time, right? So as soon as you have as few as three teams to one coach, your um, ability to, to uh, participate in their critical ceremonies is dramatically impacted. And if you only have you know, seven to 10 weeks, we're talking about approximately three sprints, um, two or three sprints, um, you're, you've just lost all your opportunities to really help that team master things like a retrospective. So um, the, the coaching ratio that I prefer is three teams to two coaches, and that tends to eliminate all bottlenecks. As long as there's two coaches to three teams, they can almost always figure out a way to get every ceremony covered. Um, so, if that's the case, if you want to try to maintain a good ratio between coaches and team, you're going to have to have some way of saying no. So um, in pilot teams management, um, we talk about how to manage the intake requests, how to, how, what criteria to use to say, yes, we'll coach project A versus project type B. Um, each one should have the biggest ROI on what going agile means, if you will. Um, the other thing, too, is this. If you have experienced coaches, um, then you should be focused on your high-risk, difficult projects. Um, your experienced coaches tend to cost more money. So if you put them on low-risk, simple projects, um, you, uh, you won't um, gain anything. So they're on a simple project, it's low-risk, and they're a very expensive coach. And when that project succeeds and people go, look, Agile worked, everyone's going to say, yeah, but that project was simple. Of course, any, it would have worked without Agile. And so what did you gain? Nothing. So you want to put them on the, on the projects where when they succeed, people go, whoa, if Agile helped that kind of project succeed, Agile definitely has a place in our organization. Now, on the second hand, if you have no experienced coaches, um, then you're going to need to put them on low-risk, easy projects because they need to gain the experience before they're trusted with the tough ones. Um, so that means a longer time to, to real value, but it's the, probably the smartest way to get there in terms of risk mitigate, mitigation. So there's, there's a business case for having experienced coaches is that you can, you can accelerate your transformation and possibly rescue projects that are, are truly difficult to be successful with. And finally, um, it, sometimes people will come to me and say, Anthony, I don't think uh, Agile could work on an infrastructure. I don't think it could work on a mainframe project, or I don't think it can work on insert type X here. Um, and so the you know the fair response to that is, oh really? You don't think it works on infrastructure? Let's do an infrastructure pilot next to prove that right or wrong. <laughs> so you basically um, you basically make them a pilot whenever they complain, and so people stop complaining because they don't want to be made into pilots. <laughs> or they complain, and then you find out that it actually does work, and everybody advances. Okay. So I see a question. Um, it says uh, from Doc Brown, what is the SLP for a nominated junior coach to earn their coaching badges? At what level are they on their own? Oh, that's a great one. I love that, Doc. Um, so uh, in our kit for, for this one, we have um, what the specific skills are for a coach. 
Uh, but to make it simple, let's say you didn't have a, a kit. Um, one, any good, good coach should be deep in some engineering practice. They should be good at requirements, design, architecture, test, deployment, DevOps skills, um, even management. Uh, but they should be um, deep in something kind of technical. And, and if they're not deep in something technical, they're probably not going to be as effective as a coach. They can, might still be able to do it, but, uh, but it gets, works against them. Um, so the real thing then is that another coach thinks that they are self-sufficient. So here's how it works. Um, let's say that, that, Doc, you're my junior coach and I'm your senior coach. Um, I would, and let's say that uh, I said I want a coaching ratio of two to three. Well, let's say that you and I are the two. So we have a junior coach and a senior coach, and we have three projects between us. Um, what I would do is, it's going to be a bottleneck at first, but you, we're going to stagger start the project, and, we're, and you're going to come with me, and I'm going to maybe lead an iteration planning session. When I'm done leading it, um, for we still have two more projects that have to do iteration planning. At that point, I'll ask you, do you want to lead the next one, or do you still need me to lead it um, with me? What, what, uh, so I can either observe you leading it, or you can lead it. And you might say, oh, no, I'm not ready to lead one yet. I want to watch it yet. Okay, that's going to slow down your time to independence. On the other hand, Doc, I have people who um, I have people who say I read over this stuff. Can we just talk about it? I want to lead the very first one. And I'm like, oh, you don't want to watch me lead it once at all? They're like, no, no, just jump in if I need it. And I'm like, all right. And so for those coaches, sometimes it works amazing. They're they're just naturals at it. Other times it's a disaster. <laughs> they give some of the worst advice I've ever heard. But we laugh about it, we correct it, and we move on. So the bottom line is, it's just like the rest of the game. Education. Um, you you can practice by doing, but someone who's a higher level has to help you, and then eventually that person and you agree, I don't need to be helped anymore, and that's when you've achieved level three. If you want to become level four, or level five coach, you have to help other junior coaches become level threes as well. So the same exact pyramid scheme. Um, in terms of the SLP, uh, it typically takes me one project to turn a coach into. Um, into a uh, self-sufficient coach. So um, I would say that that's going to be seven to 14 weeks. No, it would be seven to 20, seven to 20 weeks, and that would be 90% of the time. Seven to 20 weeks, 90% of the time. Oh, and I got a happy face. Thanks, Doc. Thanks. That was an awesome question. I really appreciate you asking something. Um, makes me feel like I'm not here all of myself. <laughs> okay, what's next? Uh, badge number four. So this one is the culture change badge, and it's a very interesting badge, right? It was very difficult for me to figure out a way to come up with reusable practices around culture change. It's such a it's such a loose, ephemeral thinking thought thing. Um, but uh, here's what I got for you. So first off, um, my current client, Andres Borke, he's got this great saying. He says, agile equals iterative plus culture. He, he came up with that in response to one of my quotes, which was, Iterative is technically challenging. Agile is culturally challenging. So mine's more verbose. That's so why I like his better. Um, but mine is trying to say something. A lot of clients, they don't understand what they're asking for when they say, I want to go agile. They kind of think that they're asking to go iterative, uh, and, and they don't know that there's a difference. So iterative is about how do you break stuff up? How do you do architecture in increments? How do you do test every sprint? How do you do requirements all through all until the last day, right? Compared to waterfall, there's a lot of technical challenges, but it's all technical. I can teach anyone these technical skills, and now they can do architectural incrementally. They can do design incrementally, et cetera. Um, Agile, on the other hand, is not technical. It's cultural. Um, and so on the bottom here, I have some of the most common things you say about Agile. High trust. I have so many clients who are in a low-trust environment. People will not be um, transparent, which is the fourth item, because they get punished, they get beat up. I've literally seen someone call someone disrespectful for stating that that person was an impediment to the sprint results. And I'm like, that's not disrespectful, it's data. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it, They're trying to be transparent and you're beating them up for it. So it's really important that we understand there's a difference between the iterative and agile. And we want to know that so that, uh, and Andre's used the sentence quite a bit, he would go to his boss, anytime the boss pushed on him, pushed back on these uh, changes, Andre would say, well, let me ask you a question. Are you sure you don't want to just go iterative? Because if we just go iterative, that goes away. If you really want to be agile, you have to allow for these culture changes, and, you, and you're, you're impeding those. You're not helping to remove those. So, um, 
so that's uh, so that's what we're getting on this slide. It's understanding that agile has a cultural impact, uh, and so how do we get those culture in impacts to change? Okay. Um, so here are um, here's one aspect. We want to create what are called high performing teams. And we saw that we have a badge for that later on, but that badge is a part of the culture change as well. So if you want to change culture, define what a high-performing team is. Here's our definition. It doesn't have to be yours, but we believe that this is a strong definition of a high-performing team. And here's how I use this. If I think a team is low-performing, do I just walk up and say, you guys are low-performing, right? I think a lot of coaches would be quite uncomfortable telling a team that they were low-performing, and, and it, it could you know, hurt morale, it can make people unhappy. Now, if you're in New York, that's exactly what you do. Because in New York, we just say it like it is. You're low performing, like, all right, well, what's it take? Uh, but if I'm in the Midwest, then you know I might get thrown out of the account for saying something like that. But uh, so you gotta you play to your audience. But bottom line, I do find a way to say, look, there's a gap between high performing teams and where we are right now. Where is that gap for us? And I'll show them this list. And I'll say, you know, looking at this list, what do you lack? What do we not do well today? So I had one team, it, they were considered to be the lowest performing team in the organization. Um, and I was asked to be their coach. Now, um, they had already had three previous coaches and four scrum masters, all of whom failed to transform this team at all. Um, so when, I, when they asked me to do it, it was sort of a, Anthony, you know, you, you say you're good at this stuff. Can you take on a team and see and show us? <laughs> I'm like, okay. I go, this is actually win-win for me. I can't lose. If this team doesn't transform, well, seven other people fail to transform before me. So, you know, no one's going to be surprised. Um, on the other hand, if this team does transform, I'll be looked at as like a hero. So I literally can't lose. Absolutely, I'll take this on. And one of the first things I did with them is showed them this, this list. And I said, looking at this list, which of these do we not do today? And they said, we don't speak up, <laughs> which is funny because they didn't speak up. And then the one guy who spoke up says, we don't speak up. And I'm like, that's funny because you just did what it is that you say you don't do. You know? So it was kind of a, a infinite loop there. Um, but then after he said that, a few more people became more open. They began to have fun. Um, there was a huge problem with respect on the team. They were literally from three different companies, vendors, and they were sabotaging each other, trying to get their, their own vendor resources into those roles, like, and they admitted it. Um, so there was a ton of dysfunction. By showing them the list of what it means to be high-performing, this was one of the ways we changed the culture of that team. Um, and in the end, um, I, I, am, uh, I rolled off that team um, just now. But uh, there's a new VP who is leading the Agile transformation for all organizational units. Uh, and he came to visit, and he asked to see a team in action. And it was this team that uh, they did a, a, a demo for him out of sequence. That they, They're so good at demoing now, they just did They said, yeah, we can do a demo right now. They did a demo for him of, um, of their work and of their team. And, uh, and when he left, he said, OK, they just raised the bar on what it means to do Agile. I'm going to bring this back to my organization and see if we can't get as good at demoing as what I just saw. So um, very awesome success story there. OK, more things to do. So again, changing culture, difficult, difficult. Um, so number one, adopt an organizational change model. I'll talk to you more about that on the next slide. Two, leaders must lead by visibly embracing the culture first. My favorite trick for this bullet, I ask the leaders to look at these four things along the bottom, or any other thing that's culturally interesting from Agile, name it, I trust, and then do something big that embraces that idea, right? So it's like, um, yeah, I've opened up my calendar so that everybody can see the exact meetings I'm working on in order to be more transparent in the organization, right? That might be an example. Um, I'm not saying it's a good example, but find ways to do at a big level these things that Agile wants, and people will start to be inspired to follow your lead. That's how leaders can, can true. It's a simple formula for leadership. Um, you can also brand your flavor of Agile. So um, I can't tell you how effective this is. One of the things you're going to want to do is see how adopted your flavor of Agile is. Well, there's a lot of organizations already doing Agile. And so when you say, are you doing Agile, they'll say, yeah. And you're like, OK, but are you doing our new kind of Agile? Or are you doing the other kind of Agile where we never saw any good results out of it? And they're like, I don't know because you didn't brand it. So hip for the Honeywell iterative process, neat for the near agile transformation, crumb, safe, you've heard of safe, scale agile framework, that's a commercial one, right? But um, it, whether it's internal, whether it, whether it's commercial, um, you, uh, you brand your flavor 
And now you can track how many people are doing HIT versus how many people are doing traditional or other agile. Okay. Um, metrics plus opinion changes culture. On this one, um, I've learned you need both of these. If you have just metrics and you show people, look at the metrics of our agile teams compared to our, our traditional teams, people don't believe the metrics. But if you have opinion, oh, I think Agile's better, people are like, yeah, that's your opinion. Where's your evidence? When you have both, I have data, and by the way, the, the team, there's a guy next to you will tell you he believes these metrics. When you have both opinion and metric, culture starts to change, and it's harder to resist. We already talked about skill growth gamification. Um, there's ways to measure culture change. Communities of practice will also change culture, and then the sayings to change by list at the end of the deck will help as well. This here um, talks about different frameworks for change. The organizations that change the fastest have a single change framework for all change, not just going agile. The two most common I know of are Cotter and Adcar. I prefer Adcar, as you can see here from this slide, it's simple. And I like it because I can memorize it, whereas Cotter's a little more complex. And when I read his stuff, I'm less surprised. Adcar surprised me more often. So I like the Adcar model. But pick either one, I don't care. Um, commit to it throughout your whole organization and all of your changes will change much faster. Okay, so we're almost out of time and we're only on number five, so I'm gonna speed things up a little bit just so you can get a flavor of what's left. Um, I'm hoping IBM will make the slides available to you guys. Um, we'll ask at the end there if that's the case. Um, but uh, hopefully you guys can get the slides and see what else is in here. Here's some of the other things. Transformation measurement, we, we have committed to what we call QP measures, QPPE, QP, quality, predictability, productivity, engagement. We believe that you can measure anything in, in the software world with just these four measures. You can measure releases with QP, teams with QP, portfolios, the transformation that we're doing with QP. Um, we can account for any innovation ideas. What is the ROI of that, right, with QPs? We can do throwdowns. My estimation technique is better than yours. We can use QPs to prove a win. Um, so come up with your scheme or adopt ours. Um, here is the skill growth. So I talked about the levels zero through five. You can see level three is the practitioner level. If everyone's level three, you're independent. Level fours and fives help you bring level zero ones and twos up to threes. Um, but the ultimate goal is once everybody's three, you can retire that transformation piece. Uh, and here you can see a graph of different um, project management requirements, architecture, these are different badge types. And you can see info dev has very little growth, but test has gotten to level four in red for every single one of the uh, of the practices or the badges. So low, so test is completely independent. And the executive who saw this said, wow, how, did, did, did test do something specific that we can then replicate? That's how you want to use metrics. Look for innovation ideas, move the innovation ideas around, and see if they move other teams into a better position. Um, for continuous improvement, we, in, we put into place a change management system where people can submit requests against any badge. This badge needs to be better for this, this or we're, we're missing a badge altogether. So by being able to submit requests and then we can track to see how they do, um, we, uh, we continuously improve. And we actually tie skill growth to it. You can't get to level three unless you've submitted improvement ideas. You can't get to level four unless you've implemented someone else's idea. And you can't get to level five unless other people are implementing your ideas. So that's, that's the uh, tying the skill growth into our badge gamification. Community of practice, hopefully you guys have some experience here but uh, they're often fail, they often are boring. What they can be is the best hour of my day. Uh, we've had teams say that to us, um, that are four really high performing cops. Um, so here I tell you, start with coaching and scrum master cops, uh, have a backlog of topics that you, you burn through. Um, and then uh, how would you all answer my tough, interesting, amusing question? Today I was told I contradicted you. Here's what I said, here's what they said. You said, what should we tell them now? So we're talking about true tactical things as, instead of just theoretical ones, and that's typically how you get cops going better. Um, and then uh, there's a bunch of other cops, the tester, architect, developer. I actually put them in the order they tend to manifest. But uh, of course, they can go any order you want. We are smarter together. That's the whole idea of a cop. OK, um, high performing teams. I mentioned that this is a badge I instantiate for each team. But you can see, I mentioned there's 54 badges. There's 10 every team badges. There's four agile requirement badges. Uh, there's four architecture badges. There are two uh, Agile development badges, three Agile test badges, um, et cetera. So I don't have to read those off to you, but you can see that we have lots of badges of different type. Um, I didn't have the space to list them all here, but on the next slide, I listed just the every team ones for you. So if you go back, there are you know about 10 categories of these 54 badges. 
the biggest one is every team. And again, if your portfolio, if your transformation, if your program, these still apply to you. Uh, prepare for iteration zero, execute iteration zero, iteration planning, daily standups, demos, retros. How to do release planning, that's the biggest Achilles heel, release planning in most of my clients. Agile estimation, fast estimation, and how to manage risk in an agile fashion. So these are different badges that the teams can earn, um, and that's the every team. So that's why I put it here. For high performing programs, uh, it's the same as a team, plus there's 15 additional ones. How to, um, this one uh, borrows heavily from the Scaled Agile Framework, or SAFE. SAFE has some really amazing secret sauce in the program level, so we have a lot of their stuff here. Uh, plan and if iteration, uh, SAFE release planning, writing SAFE features, doing a system demo, et cetera. So these are the SAFE badges that we can teach a team. For portfolio management, uh, this is my favorite space to work in. I, any client I go to, my goal is to somehow get finagle myself into their portfolio team. Uh, and here are the 10 badges that we can earn together. How to do portfolio analysis, how to do portfolio estimation, how to account for any innovation, how to profile your successes versus your failures, um, how to have portfolio metrics that show which teams are, are your highest performing teams so that you can replicate their, their skills, um, how to make sure you align with business objectives, et cetera. So you can see all these here. Um, my favorite thing to consult in. Finally, the high-performing transformation team is the 12 badges you just saw. So every time I help a team do that, I grow my, my acumen in all 12 badges. And then if, if you ever help another team within your own organization, you also would grow this badge. So this badge is rarely grown internally, but it can be. And that's it for the badges. So um, we are at the top of our time. I will, I will before the questioning part starts, although I'm not sure if there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, I did want to share with you my things to change by. Um, so these are the ones I've learned from other people that I love using. So I, I put them here just because they're some of my favorites, even though they're not mine. Perfect is the enemy is good. Fail fast. Stop starting and start finishing. That's all about reducing your work in progress. We'll reduce whip. Uh, plans are, this is probably my favorite one on the list lately. I got this one from, Andre uses it a lot. Now I, I'm addicted to it. Plans are nothing. Planning is everything. Uh, I'm not even sure if that's the correct way of saying that one. I think it's from a general marshal or some something or other. Maybe someone can put it into the chat there. Um, but uh, but I love this one because it's so true. And my favorite way of describing it is if you watch any bank heist movie, they always have this plate. There's this spot where they um, they show the plan, but they actually show it you know through visual. And they're like, first this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. So they planned out the whole thing. Then they actually go and do it. And of course, nothing goes the way that the plan was set. But because they had a plan, they're able to recover and redirect and still achieve the ultimate goal of robbing the bank or whatever it is you're trying to do. So planning is everything. People don't get how important planning is. But the few that do get how important planning is, they don't get that the plan itself is nothing. <laughs> right? it's, okay, now that we planned, we got a good sense, forget the plan. <laughs> it's like, wait, what? Uh, it's true. Works great. Embrace change. And then a quote from Ginny Rometty from uh, – from uh, IBM, I figure that's really appropriate for you guys. Uh, change and comfort do not coexist. Um, so a, a lot of people don't like how uncomfortable I make them, uh, and they think it's a bad thing. And I'm like, no, if I'm not making you uncomfortable, we're not changing. So get used to it. You're going to be uncomfortable around me. That's why I'm here. Uh, these are the ones I made up. So I'll let you guys browse these on your own so that we can have some 10 minutes for questions here. Um, but I've broken them up into five major categories. Um, quotes about transforming. transforming like. My favorite one here is consistency stifles innovation. I have so many executives that say, Anthony, I want all my Agile teams to follow the same pro process. And I said, do you realize that if that was true, then there would be no, in, there would be no high performers? Everybody would be the same performer. If you enforce consistency, you stifle the innovation of high performers. So what you need is a different solution than consistency. Uh, you, you need a solution that gives you a baseline and then allows people to be inconsistent and to, and to maximize the inconsistencies that lead to the biggest innovations. It's almost like evolution, if you believe in it. Um, you know, we, it's like nature randomly does stuff, and the things that work, you know, we keep. You got to allow for inconsistency. Uh, don't reward or, uh, and punish metrics. Instead, reward the innovations that people use to change metrics. Um, so use the same process for all your own. We were talking about that on estimation. Here's on. A, here's a good one. Don't treat estimates like exactimates. Right? <laughs> they're either estimates. Stop treating them like they're they're supposed to be right. Uh, there's the SLPs. Don't use developer guesses. Use SLPs. Um, on coaching, probably my most commonly used one is it's a self-correcting problem. Anthony, we need to correct. We, you know that team's doing this. This team's doing that. I'm like, yeah, self-correcting. 
I'm like, you don't have to go actively manage that. They will figure out that that's a, a poor way to get there, and they will get there better. Um, and uh, there's on saying no. Um, the, the, my probably number one favorite is there are no must and no can't and agile. Point out the risks and said, very bad coaching is you can't do that or you must do that. The minute you say that, you're no longer a coach. Now you're a project manager in command and control. You need instead to point out the risk. If you do that or if you don't do that, this bad thing might happen. And then let them decide what that means to them. Um, you'll get a lot more change out of people. Uh, the, the near the bottom there, track how often leaders say no. If you're a leader and you say no to me more than two or three times, I start putting a metric on you. And then at the end of the week, I'll say, so if this week you said no to me on eight different things. I just want to keep you up to date on that. Um, and then on failure, big, big, big problem for my clients. Um, they, uh, they're, they won't, they punish failure. And what happens when you punish failure? No one will tell you what's wrong. And what happens when no one will tell you what's wrong? You cannot improve the true things that are wrong. So the stupidest thing you could ever do is punish failure. And in fact, there are companies who reward failure. Um, they, they literally reward failure. When someone fails, they make it big and they, and they reward it. And then suddenly more and more people start coming forward with failure. And now we can have a chance to improve. Um, there are, um, there's so much in this particular space about failure and punishment um, that I'd love to talk more about, but we're out of time. Uh, here are five clients that I've done this with, and you can see um, SLPs for each of them, six, three, seven, seven. Um, and then underneath there, I put a little profile, what, you know, what their start state looked like, what we did, um, some of the achievements that we did. Um, so you can browse those on your own, but they're nice high level ones. And then I took one of them, and I told you about the QP metrics, and I showed you how we use QP metrics to uh, um, to highlight what we did with one particular client. So here's the QP metrics for one of them. Um, and that's it. So we have eight minutes left <laughs> uh, instead of 15. But uh, I would have spent more time for questions, but since I didn't see too many popping up during the conversation, I thought maybe there wouldn't be too many, and I'd hate to lose the, time, the extra eight minutes. So um, for the questions part, do we go off a of mute for that, or do we still put them in here? Um, attendees can just question. type their questions in the questions box and we can get to those. Okay, and then I have a question for you. Um, will these slides be made available to the people who participated? Yes, um, if you can send me those afterwards, I will get them posted in the archives and then send out the link to everyone. Excellent, great. And then if you, uh, if you email me directly, I'm happy to just send it to anybody who knows as well. And I thought my email would be on this slide here, but it looks like it's not. Um, so my email is uh, a crane. So my first letter and my last four, five C R A I N spelled oddly compared to normal crane. A crane at blueagility.com. So right here, a dot crane at blueagility.com. All right. So I see some questions. Cool. Um, so great presentation. Love to see the slides. So Kevin, um, it sounds like you can either email me at the or you can go and download it because um, I will be sending it. In. All right, now I see another one. This is from Jose. It says, do you believe in a big project between an IT consulting and a client running in an agile mode? I mean that our main difficulties are related to how to sell an agile project format to a big project without saying how much it will cost. I know that today I make mistakes in the majority of our projections. What are the main concerns we have to deal with in this type of situation. Um, so is it possible for him to come off a of mute and explain that verbally, or do I have to go off and work with Yeah, I can unmute Jose. That'd be awesome. I Jose, can. I'd like you to articulate your question if you don't mind, unless you're not comfortable doing that. OK, let's unmute him. All right, Jose, you should be live now. Can you hear us? Hi, Jose. If you're if you're not if you'd rather just do it via by typing, that's fine. But if you wanted to speak, you are now unmuted and can tell us what you're thinking. All right, I'll try to work from what I see here then. Um, so, do you believe in a big project between an IT consulting and a client running an ad in an agile mode? Um, so I would have to say to so I'm trying to dissect the question for that part. Absolutely, um, we do that all the time. So we're we are a consulting firm, and we work with big projects a lot. Um, 
And then it says, I mean that our main difficulties are related to how to sell an Agile project format. Oh, and Jose doesn't have a microphone, so he's not able to speak. Okay, thanks, Jose. Um, so uh, I mean that our main difficulties are related to how to sell an Agile project to a big project without saying how much it will cost. So what I don't understand here, Jose, is if you're talking about who we're talking about selling to and what it is that we're selling, are we selling um, the idea of going Agile? Um, and we're saying we don't know what the cost is of going Agile. If that's your question, um, then uh, that's something that's not easy to describe just, you know, in a couple minutes here, but it's something that we do for a living, right? We, we at, For a living, we go into big clients who have very big projects and we help them to see the business case and value of partnering with an IT consulting house to, in fact, adopt Agile. And, in fact, here's a funny thing, um, Jose. The bigger the project, the more cost-effective it is. See, the little projects, they don't have a lot of budget. So if we help a little project and we cost a lot of money, that it's just it's upside down. We're never going to get that ROI. We're as big projects have much bigger pro, bigger budgets, and so the same cost has is a is a tiny blip on their on their numbers chart. So it actually is easier. Now here's the interesting thing. Then how do you get the small projects to get that same level of coaching? Um, that by having people who are have already been on big projects successful, they take those same skills, and now when they go to small projects, they don't need to be taught them. They already have embraced them and enculturate them. And they will just do them on small projects without having to take on that overhead. So in general, we tend to like to work with the bigger projects and then let the small projects reap the benefit as people come off of those projects and join little projects. Um, so again, I'm not sure if that's um, what you're talking about. In terms of you said um, that you don't always make the predictions correctly. Estimation is a very difficult thing to get right. This is where I want to use SLPs instead of estimation skills in order for companies to start estimating without having to rely on developers figuring out cost and time. Uh, the entry criteria, however, is that we do have to master story point estimation and relative estimation. But those are very easy skills. Um, and so uh, if we teach those easy skills and then teach the executives how to use SLPs, we can alleviate anybody's need to be right on their guessing. OK. Any other questions? And Jose, did that answer yours a little bit? Oh, look, there's more. Uh, oh, wait, no. No, that's it. So with Jose, that helped a little bit. And I don't see any other questions. And I don't think I see anything in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, it's been a real pleasure working with everybody. I hope that you guys got value. If you have any questions afterwards, again, a.crane at bluejilly.com. Um, I'll be happy to answer anything else. Ah, and Jose said yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Very kind. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for attending today's webcast. Um, again, we'll have the recording and slides available tomorrow in the webcast archives. You'll receive a follow-up email with a link to those. And as you exit, please take a few moments to fill out our post-event survey. This helps us improve future events. And we appreciate your feedback on that. This concludes the event for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a great day.